In this lecture, we'll quickly review uh, the free response of undamped and damp systems, the analytical equations for this, and um, some of the quantities that you learned about in your vibrations class. I'm assuming that you've seen all of this before, so I'm going to move pretty quickly, but I hope that you'll bring any questions that you have to class, especially if you um, took a class other than EMA 545, so maybe you have a little different background and haven't seen some of the notation that we'll use. But, um, so we'll, we're focusing today on this one degree of freedom system right here. So we have a, a mass, um, a linear spring, and a linear dash pot. And we're trying to um, understand the motion of this system. And you know that physically, if we pull the mass to the right, um, you know, if we displace it, that um, the spring will cause it to recoil and it will, you know, oscillate back and forth like that. So physically, that's what happens. Mathematically, if you wanted to study this, you would use Newton's laws to do a force balance. So first we draw a free body diagram and you draw the restoring force from the spring. So here, if the mass has been displaced from equilibrium by a distance x, the spring's gonna pull back with a force kx. Um, similarly, if it has a velocity to the right of x dot, then the dash pot is going to push it back with a, try to slow it down with a force cx dot. And so anyway, you balance all of that, and we can write this one degree of freedom equation of motion. So there's our equation for the system. You also probably learned that we usually write this in a second order form. So uh, we divide through by the mass, and we call this quantity C over M, we call that two zeta omega N, where zeta is the damping ratio. And then k over m is called the natural frequency squared. And we see in a second why we use those definitions. Um, so the natural frequency is the square root of the ratio of the stiffness to the mass. Okay, so if we um, have an undamped case, then we won't worry about the dash pot and we won't worry about the force for a free response case. And so we just have this differential equation right here, and you learned in vibration class, or maybe even in math or physics, that the solution to that equation is some constant times a cosine omega nt and some constant times a sine omega nt. So that explains why we use this definition here. The natural frequency shows up as the oscillation rate for the system there. So you could plug that into the differential equation, but all that would accomplish is just proving that this is in fact the solution of the equation. So what you would really be doing is you'd be using the initial conditions to uh, figure out what those constants C1 and C2 are, and then you would have X of T would be known. Um, uh, when I teach vibrations, we like to use uh, this form here, and we'll see in a minute why it's so nice. But here, we write this rather than a sine of a, and a cosine, we write it as the real part of some complex number. So this has real and imaginary parts. Complex number times e to the i omega nt. So this is a vector in the complex plane. And this actually makes things um, very convenient to work with. So all of that is detailed right here. So let's look at that for a minute. So um, we have real part of x e to the i omega nt. So here is that vector x. It has a real part and an imaginary part. So um, we can draw it as a vector in the complex plane. And if we just ignore the e to the i omega nt for a minute, if we just take the real part of x, that's just the projection of this vector down onto the real axis. So um, it turns out at time zero, e to the i omega nt is zero. So we could use that to draw where this curve will start. 
And then as time advances, if you remember from your complex algebra, e to the i times anything, e to the i theta, basically just rotates a vector in the complex plane by an angle theta. So if we take x e to the i omega in t, that will just be our original x rotated through this angle omega in t. And so now this product is a vector over here. So sometime t later, the real part has gone from being this to now being this projection right here. So um, basically the real part has gone through zero and now it's a negative number. So that would be something, you know, down here. So we can use all of that to sketch what's going to happen. If we imagine this, this vector x here, and we imagine it rotating, we can see that uh, we're a ways past having our maximal real value because the biggest this would ever be is when um, x e to the i omega t was down here. So, so that would happen in negative time. That already happened. And we're chugging along. We come through the maximum. We're going to, we're going to get to this point here where the projection of x onto the real axis is 0. And then we'll go down until we finally get over here. X e to, when x e to the i omega t is over there, we'll have our negative maximum. So anyway, you can see that the response has to look like this. And this height here is nothing more than the length of that complex number, the length of that vector x. So that's... Um, so in one quantity there, we have um, this oscillation captured. And notice this one's neither a sine or a cosine. Um, if it was a sine, it would start at zero and um, you know look like this, start at zero and go up. If it was a cosine, it would start at the maximum value. So this is neither a sine nor a cosine. It's a combination of the two. Um, or a phase shift of either of them. And so it's the most general way to write a sine or a cosine or any harmonic function is to write it as an x e to the i omega in t. So that's why that's so useful. If, um, so that's our solution. Um, again, so really simple. If we have one of these problems, all we have to do is um, define um, x of t, we assume x of t is either of these forms. We just figure out the initial conditions, um, figure out x to satisfy the initial conditions, and away we go. What if we put damping back in? Then our equation becomes this, and we add this extra term here. And now the function above is no longer a solution for the system. So, um, but we know from math that if we plug in this, if we just change the form slightly, if we we're looking at the real sine cosine one, it actually gets changed quite a bit, looks quite a bit different. But if we're looking at complex exponentials, all we did is take i omega in and replace that with lambda. If we do that, we can show that this is a solution to the equation. And we would do that by um, plugging this into the equation, we need to take a derivative and plug it in. And the nice thing about this form, the, uh, this is a constant derivative of e to the lambda t is just lambda e to the lambda t. So anytime we have a derivative, we just multiply by lambda again. The, by the way, I guess I should mention the real part. If we have a complex number, say a plus ib, Right, the real part just takes the part that doesn't have an i in it, it takes the a. So that, um, we can ignore that when we take a derivative. The real, taking the real part is not a function that we have to worry about taking the derivative of. So if we plug all of those in, um, we get this expression. And because these are real numbers, 
we can move them inside the real part here without changing anything. All they're doing is scaling this, this vector. Um, and so that lets us combine everything and write it this way. We factored out the e to the lambda t from each of these. We factored out the x from each of these. And so now we end up with this polynomial in lambda and um, times x times e to the lambda t is equal to 0. And if we think about what this equation means, again, looking at the real and imaginary plane, we have some vector x. We're going to multiply it by something that could cause it, in this case, it could cause it to be longer or shorter, and it could change the angle. And then we're going to multiply it again by e to the lambda t, which could do additional rotations and things. But we say that for any t, this has to be equal to 0. And so we know the only way that can happen is if the, if the vector is not a vector, but just a point here at the x-axis. Because any vector in the complex plane will eventually have a real part for some t, if I multiply by e to the lambda t. So that tells us then that this quantity here has to be 0. For x to be 0 would mean we'd have to have 0 initial conditions. And that's just the trivial solution. OK, so that tells us that the solution is just the solution to this polynomial. We plug that into the quadratic formula. We simplify. And we end up with this. And again, hopefully in your vibrations class, you learned about the fact the zeta for an underdamped system is usually less than 1. It's actually usually pretty small. So um, that's the damping ratio. And so we factor out a negative 1, and we write this as i omega n squared of 1 minus theta squared. And this is an equation that any good vibration engineer has memorized, because you see it over and over again. But this is the root of a system. And it has some important quantities. It has zeta, the damping ratio. And in your vibrations class, you talked about how a large damping ratio means the oscillations die away quickly. A small one means they last a long time. And then it also has the natural frequency. And um, this imaginary part is the part that we're going to oscillate at. So we give this a special name. We call it omega d. This is called the damped natural frequency. And it's very close to the natural frequency. It just has this little correction factor here. If zeta, you know, zeta is typically, say, 0.01, so that's practically 1 just a slight decrease in the natural frequency. Anyway, we see why these are important if we plug them back in to what we started with, right? We started by making this assumption. So if we plug lambda back in there, um, we can use the rules of exponentials that ad adding the exponents the same as multiplying exponentials. And we can write it this way, real part of x e to the negative zeta omega t e to the i omega dt. So uh, this part, hopefully you recognize, this is just a constant. So any e to the negative at is just a decaying exponential. So it will look like this. So if we lump that here, that's kind of like saying that as time advances, this vector x is just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Right? So that vector is shrinking. And this part, e to the i omega dt, this part is still causing it to rotate. So similar to the previous case, only now the vector is shrinking as it rotates. So we can kind of visualize that in the complex plane by imagining that as this vector is um, turning, it's rotating. And again, at some instant in time, this would be x 
it has the e to the negative zeta omega in t that's made it a little shorter than it started. And it has the e to the i omega dt, and that's the angle that we've rotated through. And um, so from that, we could sketch the response here. Um, I find it easier to do that if we actually draw this envelope on there. Um, let's, let's do that with a little lighter pen. So if we draw the envelope, it would be symmetric top and bottom. So we'll try to do that. And then um, as last time, we're, we, X is, I drew in the same quadrant. So we're starting negative. And now we'll oscillate at the natural damped natural frequency. And those oscillations will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So um, just looking at this equation, it, once we know the number x, the complex number x, we could draw the damped response really easily. All right, so that's the analytical solution. Um, and really, there are just two equations to remember. For an undamped system, it's this one. For a damped system, it's this one. And by the way, the undamped is just a special case of the damped. So you could just remember one equation has the exact same functional form. If you um, try to do it with sines and cosines, you have to remember this somewhat longer, messier equation. And this derivation is a lot messier. So um, again, all of you, this all should look familiar. You should be able to do any of the derivations I did here if given enough time with your notes from your previous class, I would hope. So these are the analytical solutions. Um, before we go into the next thing, I just wanted to mention the book describes how you can use all of this to define something called the log decrement. And the log decrement delta is defined as 1 over k times the natural log of the nth peak divided by the n plus k peak. So if k was 2, we'd take um, this peak here and this peak here, and we'd plug those in and we'd have k equals 2. And um, it turns out that, that because of the natural log, that ratio, it's all basically about trying to, to figure out um, the zeta in the, e in the decay envelope of the system. Right, All of those peaks are governed by this decay envelope. So anyway, the book derives and shows that if you knew delta, you can figure out zeta. And usually our damping is small, and so we can actually just use this equation. This one's a little nastier to solve, but it's still doable. But um, anyway, so that's um, something that we use frequently in the laboratory. We measure a signal like this. We might put a cursor here and a cursor there and use that to estimate what the damping ratio is. Um, so we'll do that in the first lab in this class. Um, to give you a sense of damping, um, this little table kind of talks through it. I'll let you read that on your own. But um, these, these are in percent. So here when it says 1, this is, point, this is zeta equals 0 0.01 to 0 0.02. But um, anyway, these give you some ideas, you know, um, a single piece might have 1% uh, damping. Actually, if it's a single piece of metal or something kind of solid, I would say that this could actually be much smaller. You know, steel, solid piece of steel, it would be more like that. But, um, you know, riveted or bolted structure like an airplane, damping might be something like that. If we get to plastics and honeycomb, we get a little higher damping. Um, so anyway, there's some. You, there are lots of other places you can find data like that. But you know, typical structures, um, you know, zeta of two percent, three percent. That's really common for a lot of what we'll see in the world and the types of things you'll test in this class.
Okay, so you'll do a problem that uses everything that we just talked about in the lecture here in the homework. So we won't uh, talk about that here. We'll work on that during class. And there were some slides on the website talking about numerical integration. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly, though, that the key to understanding how to use numerical integration is this idea that we define an we have a second order system and MATLAB only knows how to integrate first order ones with the basic solver at least. So we define this state vector and um, we uh, plug in x, x dot. Um, we plug in the state and its derivative as the two elements, the first and the second element of our state vector. And then MATLAB wants us to have z dot equals some function f of z. So um, we take the derivative and then we come down here and we recognize that x dot, well that was just the second state, so that's already known. To get x double dot, we move all of these terms to the other side. And so we can write that equation this way. And so now we have a function z dot equals f of z. And notice because x is just the first element of z, x dot is the second element. So all of these things are known. So um, we can use that to solve. And pretty much everything we do in this class, we can use MATLAB, OD45, something like that to get a solution that we can check our answers with. That's also useful because um, everything we've done so far is assuming that the damping forces are linear. They're a constant times the velocity, that the damping force is just a scalar constant times velocity or a linear function. Um, we could also have Coulomb friction where the friction force actually um, is constant. It doesn't depend on velocity. The only thing it depends on is the sign of velocity. So if our x dot is this way, friction is going to push us backwards. And if um, we had x dot the other way, then that would flip. A similar kind of thing with aerodynamic drag. This you would learn about in EMA um, 363, I think it is. So I won't go through all the definitions, but basically the drag force depends on the drag coefficient, the area, the fluid density. So you get more drag through water than you do through air. And um, the velocity squared is the key thing here. So this is also a nonlinear function. So um, we can try these out in MATLAB. So let's go ahead and do that and just see that quickly. So this is how you would call OD45 from MATLAB. We have to first define a function that has our z dot equals f of z. So here, here I called it x just to keep you confused and on your toes. But here we have x dot equals some function of t and x. So um, here we just have unit mass and stiffness. So, um, and I said that the, the dash pot constant was 0.04. So basically, um, x dot, the first element is just the velocity, um, x z2, as we called it in our notes. And the second element, we solve every, the equation for x double dot. And that's all we've done. And then MATLAB, we just tell it that this is our function. We want to integrate from 0 to 150 seconds, subject to these initial conditions, x0. So we define the initial displacement, initial velocity. And if we run this, we'll get the solution. There's the solution from OD45. So starting with initial displacement, zero velocity, we ring down like that. Isn't that a beautiful curve? Vibrations is so fun. All right, so that's the OD45. Um, our analytical solution that we just developed says that we would write the solution in terms of the natural frequency, which is the square root of k over n.
the damping ratio, um, the C was 2 zeta omega n, so this is what we get for zeta. And anyway, we plug all of that in. And um, here, I, I, I didn't write it in the simplest form. I wrote it in the broken down form that we had in our notes a second ago. Um, I wrote it like this, right? Um, I pulled this part out, so e to the negative zeta omega, omega t, real part of x, e to the i omega dt. Okay, so anyway, that's our analytical solution. Um, it turns out our x was just q0, if we go through the derivation there. So if I run this part, by the way, control enter in MATLAB will do that, run just that cell. It took our figure and it added over the top of it blue circles for the analytical solution. And they overlay almost perfectly. A system like this is pretty easy to integrate. So the analytical solution is almost exactly the same as the numerical solution. For more complicated systems, this would be harder to do. But um, so anyway, there's our solution. And um, we have um, uh, we have it all solved, right? Um, if we wanted to go in and change our equation, for example, here, I um, will change x dot. I'll change the equation. I'll change the equation such that um, now we have a nonlinear damping with the form that we mentioned earlier. So we have a stiffness and a nonlinear damping, no dash pot. If we uh, run this one, now you see the blue is still the analytical, but the red, the Coulomb damp system, has a very different ring down, very different looking decay. And um, but that was easy to simulate in OD45. To derive an analytical solution for that would be pretty difficult. And um, you could do it piecewise, I guess, fairly easily. But anyway, but it's uh, a pain. And um, so that shows you one of the advantages of being able to do numerical integration. So that concludes everything for this lecture. We will see you in class and answer any questions you have.